All right. If you have your Bibles, 1 John chapter 3, we're going to be in this morning. We're moving right through the book of 1 John. And um, if you've been with us, uh, we're doing communion at the end of service. The ushers in the back are like, you did everything different this week. I forgot to tell you. Sorry. Um, 1 John chapter 3. So go ahead and flip there now. We're, we're studying, you know, through the book of 1 John. And uh, obviously the author is John the Apostle. For some of you folks, maybe new to the Bible, there's John the Baptist. If you want to know what John the Baptist was like, he baptized people. I know it's really complicated sometimes. But John the Apostle, he was the youngest of the disciples. Um, he loved Jesus. He always was beside him. He always found himself as close to Jesus as he could get, you know, as close to Jesus as he could get. And this morning, we're going to be in 1 John. We're going to see uh, verses, chapter 3, verse 4 through 9. And we're going to talk about how uh, this section is going to be about sin and the child of God. Sin and the child of God. You see, John loved so much that he told the truth. You know, and he did it in an amazing way. I remember when I was first saved, and I remember I was listening to a lot of messages by Pastor Chuck Smith, of the founder of Calvary Chapel. And I just remember Pastor Chuck always seemed to have joy in his heart, a smile on his face. But man, he would say some things that you'd be like, how can you deliver a message like that with such a big smile on your face, you know? Like stuff that would just, I'd be, I'd be just maybe jogging or doing some exercises or working outside and I would just go oh Lord you know the 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 pain and I really think John the Apostle is so much like that he loved so much he saw Jesus so clearly that he had to communicate the truth he just communicated and this morning if you're taking note we're going to look at sin and the child of God first John 3 you can also get Exodus chapter 20 ready in your Bible and also John chapter 15. So yesterday uh, was uh, my son's last baseball game, and uh, at it, it was very hot outside. How many guys were outside yesterday? Oh my gosh. It was a labor of love. I wanted to watch him from the car in the parking lot with the air conditioner on. But we're there, and uh, in the midst of the game, you know, they're trying their best. They're sweating their, you know, little nine-year-old heads off. And Actually, the coach's son, he was on base. He went to steal third base. And as he slid into third, the catcher threw it to third. Literally at the exact same time as he was sliding, the ball came and hit him right in the face. Right in the eye. Right in the eye. And, uh, you know, it was like, you know, I don't know how many of you guys know me very well, but I'm, oh, oh you know. And uh, everybody pretty much was. And it really was a sad thing. But the boy, the little boy is so tough. You know, he was hurt. They got him off and his mom ended up taking him you know, to get checked out. But, you know, by the grace of God, the Spirit of God kind of knocked on my heart. And I just said to, to uh, my son's baseball coach, I said, hey, you know, I just want you to know we're going to be praying for your son, Will. We're going to pray for him. You know, and he's kind of, okay, you know, you know, he's in the midst of it. The adrenaline's pumping. It's 4,000 degrees outside, you know. And I just said it, genuinely meant it, and, uh, you know, prayed for him myself. Then we, you know, the game finished, everybody went home, went home, did the stuff in the afternoon. And that evening, um, I actually got a text message from him with a picture of his son, big black eye, you know. And he said, you know, you know, Pastor Bill, thanks for praying. Will's doing much better. So then I realized, man, I really should pray with my whole family, right? Like I said, we'd pray. So I get Rachel and the kids together and we sit down to pray and you know, uh, we start praying, and we always pray the same way. Lukey starts, then Bethany, then Rachel, myself. Selah's not at the place yet where you can know what she's even saying, so she doesn't really pray much. But as we're praying, I realize in the background, Selah's cartoon is still on the television. So she starts singing along with the cartoon while we're praying. She doesn't know. She thinks it's all the same. So I say, Luke, go turn the TV off. So he goes over, he turns the TV off. We're praying. We're serious. We're praying for Will. We're praying for the family. We're believing that God is, wants to reach them for Jesus, wants them to know how good he is. And as we're praying and just seeking the Lord, all of a sudden, it, I thought like a, like a crab had come into the house and crawled up and grabbed me by the nose. All of a sudden, I felt this piercing pain right on the tip of my nose. And I opened my eyes, and there was little Selah with a big smile, just gripping my nose. You know, and I was like, 
Ah, you know, boy, nothing like that to take you right out of the attitude of prayer, you know? <laughs> nothing like that. You know, after it all finished, we prayed. You know, I gave her a big kiss, and it was okay. It was fine. Guys, listen, as we're going in our walk with the Lord, as we're seeking the Lord, you know, we sometimes can find ourselves, though people may be trying to obey Jesus and do the word, and like John the Apostle is talking about following Jesus, sometimes we could find that maybe something in our life gets a hold of us, gets a hold on us, right? Gets a grip on us. And it begins to now be a distraction from what the Lord is really calling us to. You see, John the Apostle this morning, he's going to talk to us about sin and the child of God. You know, I think some believers, they may find and begin to believe, wow, okay, I'm following Jesus now. I no longer will have any sin in my life. Eventually, I'll get to the place where I'll be sinless. Those are the Christians that genuinely uh, don't really do much for Christ in this world because it's really more of an outward facade as opposed to a real inner change, a real change in their life. You see, John, this disciple who loved Jesus so much, is going to tell you and I the truth. I love this story. It's about sin and its attraction and what it can do to a believer. Uh, This man writes about several years ago, our family visited Niagara Falls. It was springtime and ice was rushing down the river. And as I viewed the large blocks of ice flowing toward the falls, I could see that there were carcasses of dead fish embedded in the ice. Now seagulls by the score were riding down the river, feeding on the fish. And as they came to the brink of the falls, their wings would go out and they would escape from the falls. He said, I watched one goal which seemed to delay and wondered when it would leave. It was engrossed in the carcass of this dead fish. And when it finally came to the brink of the falls, out went its powerful wings, and the bird flapped and flapped and even lifted the ice out of the water. And I thought it would escape, but it had delayed too long, so that its claws had frozen into the ice, and the weight of the ice was too great, and the goal, the seagull, plunged into the abyss. You know, John the Apostle is going to warn you and I this morning about getting engulfed in sin. You know, what Jesus says about sin, what, where does it truly come from? Where did sin come from? What is it, you know? And John is going to talk to us about that this morning. So, 1 John, if you're there, chapter 3 this morning, we're going to pick it up. We're going to look at verses 4 through 9, but before we do that, let's read a little bit in advance just to get the context. So we'll start in chapter 2, verse 28. John the Apostle says, And now, little children... Abide in him, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Verse 29, he says, if you know that he is righteous, and we talked about this last week, only God is righteous. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Then John says, behold, what manner of love the father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Verse two, beloved, now we are the children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. And we pick it up in this morning's study, verse 4. John says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. Now listen, if you're taking note this morning in terms of sin and the child of God, John's talking to us about it. Number one, we have to realize according to the word of God, according to the God of the Bible, according to Jesus, there is a standard. There is a standard. You see, when it comes to sin, the reason why so much of the world almost doesn't even believe in sin anymore is because Satan has done an effective job of getting people to no longer turn to the word of God. To really, in effect, no longer believe that there is really a God. What many folks do is they have their own rendition of God. 
But John the Apostle reminds us, guys, there's a standard. There's a standard. Here in verse 4, John says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness and sin is lawlessness. You're going to read this over and over in this passage. And listen, maybe like, maybe you're like me. When I read this at first, I said, oh no, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm in trouble. Whoever commits sin, oh boy, you know, I've committed many sins. I'm in trouble. Listen, if you're taking note or you have your pen, circle that phrase, commit sin. It's very important you understand this for the entire study. It really means whoever practices sin. Can you guys say practice? It means practices. It means, and we talked about this last week. It means to do something and work at it to get better. Like whoever is, it's not stumbling into sin. The old saying goes, grace is made for falling, not for jumping, right? But grace is certainly not made for practicing sin. Jesus didn't die on the cross and forgive us of all our sins so you and I can practice sin, can work at it and get better at it. Now listen, this may be a little embarrassing for some, but if you could remember before you were a Christian, you used to practice sin. You know, I could remember, you know, getting ready to go to a party, you know. I can remember, and this is embarrassing mostly for me, what I'm about to say, but I can just remember, you kind of go through the process, you're like making sure you're looking good, you know, you get your little vibe on. It's really embarrassing. It truly is. You know, you got to listen to certain music, right? Because you got to be ready for the music when it's on. I didn't practice the dance moves. That's you guys, but not me. But, uh, but you, you pra- you're getting ready for it. Oh, I want to be ready. That's what John is talking about here. He who practices sin, practices sin, you commit. The Bible says you're, it's lawlessness. It's lawlessness. It's lawlessness. You know, he says, whoever practices it commits lawlessness. The Ten Commandments, what we see in Exodus 20, could never save us. It could never save us. Moses could not bring the children of Israel into the promised land. The law cannot save you. But what the law does is it's like a mirror and it reveals that we are in fact sinners in need of a savior. You see, the law, it's very important. There's a reason why the enemy of our souls, the enemy of humanity is aggressively trying to remove the 10 commandments from every part of the culture. Because if there's no law from a divine creator, then there is no standard. And then everyone can do what's right in their own eyes. If you're here on Wednesday studying judges, we've heard this over and over again. It's an amazing thing. Exodus 20, I had told you to turn there. I'm going to read it to you, and we're going to read it together because I wonder, even in the church today, I see these things being removed. You know, even people saying, well, Jesus, we don't need to do the Old Testament, right? If you're here on Wednesday night, you heard, okay, uh, we don't need the Old Testament anymore. We're New Testament Christians. No, Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I fulfilled it. When we read these Ten Commandments, you tell me which one of these is bad for you. <laughs> you tell me which one of these, if you do it, isn't good. Exodus 20, Moses, uh, the Lord has given this to Moses on Mount Sinai. It says, and God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Just like you and I, Jesus brought us out of the bondage of sin. The Lord brought Israel out of the bondage to the Egyptians. Verse three, you shall have no other gods before me. That's the first commandment. No other gods alongside of the Lord Jesus. Verse four, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Verse seven, this is the third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Verse eight, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Let's move down to verse 12. Honor your father and your mother. Some of the parents in here are going like this to their kid right now that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. 
Verse 13, you shall not murder. Verse 14, that's the sixth. This is the seventh. You shall not commit adultery. This is the eighth. Verse 15, you shall not steal. Verse 16, this is the ninth commandment. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You know the Bible doesn't say not to lie. It says don't bear false witness. When uh, Jesus was going to be crucified, they accused him. They said, Jesus said he would destroy the temple, and in three days he would rebuild it. But what did Jesus really say? He said, I'll destroy this temple. They bore false witness. They said what he said, but with the wrong, they weren't really being honest. You shall not bear false witness. Verse 17, number 10, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant. I'm going to do a little contemporary version here. Nor his car, nor his truck, nor anything, any tools that your neighbor has, right? The vacation your neighbor goes on, right? You know, for me, you shall not covet your neighbor's son's baseball bat that he spent $500 on for his kid. You know, you shall not covet those things. For they shall not help you hit the ball. No, that's not what it says. That's not what it says. Listen, this was written thousands of years ago. This is the law of God. This is the standard. You see, if you want to understand how to be free from sin, you first have to realize there is a standard. And you have to come to the place where you realize, in light of the law of God, are you innocent or are you guilty? When you look at the the Ten Commandments, you begin to realize, wow, you shall not bear false witness. Shall not steal shall not, you know, you have to honor your father and your mother. The Lord should always be first in your life. And if you are a genuine child of God, you should come to the, the, the law of God and realize, I fall short. I fall short. I have broken God's commandments and I'm guilty. That's the purpose of the law. That's the purpose. You see, John here is trying to tell you and I, there is a standard. And that standard should be set up in our homes. That standard should be set up not to condemn us or to judge us. The law didn't come to judge us or to beat us down. It came to us to reveal our need for what? For a savior. We need a savior. Now, I had a friend uh, bring in his laser here. This is used for, you know, carpentry and construction work. And I love this because what you do is you actually fasten this part to the wall. You put the laser on it. And it, what it does is it gives you a straight line. And while you're doing construction, you're able to keep things uniform. There's a standard, you see. There's a standard. Now imagine the line is up there and you decide, I don't really care about the line. Whatever guy put this line up, he doesn't know what he's talking about. It's, these lines are stupid. They're judgmental. He's judging me. He's telling me that it should go straight across. I want to build like this. It would be better if we built the house like this. I'm going to disregard the line. This, you're going to have a broken system, aren't you? You're going to have a broken structure. It's not going to have integrity. So what do you do? Well, what's happened in our culture is we've disregarded the standard altogether. We've actually taken it down and said, we don't like it. We want to make our own standard. And then problems arise. Problems arise when we do that. Guys, we are all under the same God, the same Bible. We all have to submit our lives to the Lord. There is no one righteous, no, not one. And John here, back to 1 John, back to 1 John in your Bibles, chapter 3. He says, whoever commits sin, if you practice sin, you're committing lawlessness. You're breaking the law. Verse 5, he says, and you know that he, Jesus, was manifested to take away our sins. And in him, there is no sin. Number two, if you're taking note in terms of sin in the child of God, number two, only Jesus takes away sin. Only Jesus can take away sin. Now that phrase there, he was manifested in verse five, you're going to see this three times, and we're going to look at one other occurrence, and there's one later on in the book. Three reasons why Jesus came to the earth. And the first main reason was to take away sin. Was to take away sin. John here goes out of his way to say, in him there is no sin. 
You have to understand, sin did not originate with God. Um, I've said this so many times, but it's worth repeating. You know, if God could sue humanity for libel, my goodness, you know, he would make a fortune. He doesn't need our money though. But the amount of information out there, the things that humanity blames God for, that God literally did the opposite of, it's unbelievable. Sin did not originate with God. We're going to see in a few verses where sin came from and where it originated. But here John says, you should know Jesus was manifested to take away sin. That word know, it means to perceive with the senses, to turn the eyes, the mind, and the attention to something. Let me ask you this morning, have you turned your attention to Jesus yet? Have you turned your attention to not to religion. I, you know, if you've been coming here for any length of time, I'm not asking you to be religious. But have you turned your attention to the person of Jesus? You know, if you come here this morning, I, I would almost guarantee you, if you came here this morning, there was just joy in your life, regardless of your circumstances, right? And you were just excited about the Lord. I guarantee you, this past week, you turned your attentions to Jesus. If you came here this morning... And you're just on the way out, you kicked the cat, right? You got on the highway, brr, that was me. No, I'm just kidding. And you're on the way and just, uh, you get into church and you're just, uh, yeah, good to see you too, you know, type of thing. <laughs> Why? Well, I, I would imagine this past week your attentions weren't on Jesus too much. You see, that's what John keeps telling us. He's trying to tell us this. He say, guys, I'm a simple man. You know, our, our pre-servant devotional this morning was about John's father, Zebedee. John was a fisherman. He was a simple man. But John says, I'm a simple man, but I've learned something. If you get close to Jesus and you stick with Jesus, oh, man, it only gets better. He keeps you. He's faithful. He is. John says he was manifested to take away our sins. He was manifested to take away our sins our sins. John chapter 1 verse 29, John the apostle is, is writing about something that John the Baptist said. And he said, John 1 verse 20, 29, John the Baptist pointed at Jesus when he came to be baptized. And he said, behold the Lamb of God that what? Takes away the sins of the world. Church, the message that God's people have to bring to this world is the greatest message that has ever been preached. It's that your sins have already been forgiven. You just have to turn to Jesus. You got to turn to the one that paid the bill. If you don't want to go to him and get the receipt, you can't go claim the prize. It's already been paid for. Already been paid for. Jesus takes away sin. John 3, 16. You guys know this verse, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what you've done, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have what? You get life eternal. It's a, it's a great deal. It is a great deal. And, and life eternal begins now. Can I say that, church? It doesn't begin when we die. It begins now. When you receive Jesus, you begin a new life in Christ. You know, only Jesus can take away sin. You know, last year around this time of the year, um, and I always kind of do it this time of year, I'll go out to my garage and I'll realize that over the winter, I'm not sure what happened in that thing, but it turned into like a garbage dump. You know, <laughs> there's stuff everywhere. You can barely walk through. And, you know, as you keep going, you accumulate more stuff. Sometimes I wonder... It may be nice to just get rid of everything. And, uh, but anyhow, and, and around this time of year, I'll go in, and last year I did this, I cleaned it out. And you kind of discover how much junk you accumulated over one year. Because what do you do? As you're cleaning it, myself, I'm not a hoarder like some of you, but anyways, I will take my stuff, I'll bring it out to the, I'll bring it out to the, uh, to the street. Now, I'm particularly blessed because uh, someone who comes to our church works for this garbage company. So I could pretty much put like anything on the street, call them, and they'll come and pick it up. It's a wonderful deal I have. But I'll bring all this stuff to the street. I mean, you'll be like, wow, does he have anything left in his house? I just bring it all out there right along the street, you know, and the garbage truck comes. It's, oh, it's one of the greatest days. 
because it's not really gone until it's gone, right? Even though you cleaned out your garage, yeah, it's still all standing right there in a pile. And you, you go out back, you go out. What a beautiful, oh my gosh, what is that? You know, that's disgusting. What is it? Who did that? Lukey goes, you dead. You know, <laughs> he's starting to get smarter as he gets older, you know. But the beautiful thing is when the garbage truck comes, these guys, they take it, they throw it all in the truck. And guess what happens? They drive away. And you know what? It's gone. I never see it again. You see, I'm not the guy that gets in the car and goes to the garbage dump and looks for good stuff. You know, I've met people like that. I go, oh, really? You want to come? No, I don't think so, you know. No, I don't want to go to the garbage dump and look for good stuff, you know. There's no good stuff at the garbage dump. I hope you guys are tracking with me now. That's what Jesus does. Only Jesus can take away sin. Only Jesus. The other world religions, they'll teach you how to cover your sin, how to kind of squeeze by in life with your sin, to pretend your sin doesn't exist. But when you open your eyes, you're still in the same pit. Only Jesus reaches into the pit with his nail scarred hands and pulls men and women out of the pit. And he can do it. I've seen him do it. He's done it in my life. And he wants to continue to do it for men, for families. Only Jesus can do this, church. And John wants us to know this. He wants us to know this. Verse 6, let's continue. So he said he was manifested to take away our sins. But now verse 6, and he says, whoever abides in him, this is tough stuff right here. John is delivering very powerful words. Does not sin. You know, I kind of put a little question mark next to that in my Bible. I don't know about you. Whoever sins, he says, has neither seen him nor known him. You know, that's where if you read your Bible with a tender heart, you go, Lord, what's wrong with me? You know, but then you begin to realize John, once again, church, circle it in your Bible. Don't let, don't let the enemy deceive you here. John is saying, whoever practices sin, it's not if you stumble in sin, that's not what this word is. You know, unfortunately we read English. This was written in Greek. The Greek language is, is much more vast than our language. So when you read it in the original tense, it's very clear that what John was saying is that if you abide in him, he doesn't continue in sin. And he says, whoever practices sin has neither seen him nor knows him. Number three, if you're taking notes, and this is really important to understand this in terms of sin and the child of God. Number three is our part is to abide. Your and my responsibility in this walk with the Lord is to abide in Christ to stay connected, to stay connected. Um, I've had the privilege to go on a few different whitewater rafting trips, you know, and it's a lot of fun. Now, the one I did where we didn't have a professional guide, it did not go well. I'm going to tell you that, you know, there's a picture of me out of the boat with just my legs sticking up, you know, (laughs) I don't know how they got that picture, but it was a scary moment. Seriously, scary. But the ones where you're in the guide with the guide, truthfully, all you're in there, you paddle, and you think, man, they couldn't make it down here without me. Yeah, they, the, the guide makes sure to tell you at the end, it would have been easier if nobody was on this boat but me. You know, they basically tell you. Your job is really only one thing. Hang on to the end of the oar. The reason why? Because if you flail and you knock the guide out, you're all dead. You know, <laughs> you're done. So you have to hang on to the oar, paddle, and no matter how scared you get, don't let the oar go. Because if you, if you let it go and somebody clocks the guide, you know, it's every man for himself type of situation. Listen, John the Apostle is telling us the same thing. You see, you want to break the habit of sin in your life, you need to abide in Christ. That's where it's at, man. There's no plan or program. These systems, they come and go. I've been saved now, what, 15 years or 20 years? I- I'm telling you, they've come and gone. I have seen so many programs come through the church And the church really is, I'm sorry, it's not an upward tick, okay? In terms of sin and and the child of God being free from sin. Why? There's only one way to get free. His name, you want to know who he is? His name is Jesus. You have to go to Jesus. If you circle Jesus, if you talk about Jesus, you have your clubs where you have Jesus t-shirts, that's fine. He'll let you do it. But you you have to actually get to Jesus. You have to spend time with Jesus. 
He wants to be with you. You have to abide. Can you say abide? It's a very important word. You see, God's very sinless nature, when you are saved, comes within you. And like a seed, that new nature has to be fed and nourished and grow. The way that happens, the Bible often calls that abiding in Christ. Abiding in Christ. Some of you, you know, uh, you know as you abide in Christ, sin's hold on your life will be broken. As I was studying this, this image came into my mind, and I hope this you know, isn't too much for church, but I just kind of thought of the, I'm not sure if you guys know who the Incredible Hulk is, you know, um, you know, I just thought of like the little, it's kind of funny, the little guy, you know, the, the old movies had that guy, I'm like, the Incredible Hulk, he's Incredible Hulk before he's Incredible Hulk, for the size of him, but, but later on, that it's this little skinny guy, but as the, whatever, <laughs> his anger or whatever happens, all of a sudden he just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and his shirt just rips off, you know, and you know, I want to look like that one day myself. But, um, you know, it's kind of like that for the child of God. I'm going to tell you that. that. That's kind of been my experience, spiritually. Is that as you abide in Christ, what happens? You're like, Lord, how am I going to get free from this and that and this and this circumstance, these people? All the right. And the Lord's like, abide. And you abide, and what happens? As you abide, you, you grow. And as you grow, you know what happens? That chain that you you had so many people come over and go, I've got the special key that unlocks this chain. Watch me do it. And they do it and you're, you're like, you spun the lock around a few times. Nothing's happened though, you know? And then the other group, and then this book, and then this special, you know, I don't even know. Some of the stuff I see now, I just, I try to be nice, but anyhow. And then what happens? You abide and what happens? You grow and what happens? The chains just break. They break off. And almost you go, when did this break off? When did this even happen? All of a sudden, I'm walking with Jesus. I'm enjoying Jesus. I'm going in his direction. I don't really care for these things anymore. You know, I don't care for them. You know, I, remember, I remember many years ago, I was working um, at a particular institution and just was there. And, you know, one of my coworkers was kind of talking to me. And they're like, man, Bill, you're, you know, you're a cool guy. You know, you've. You're Jesus? You're like God stuff? You know, you have your Bible. And I remember saying, like, telling me a little bit about his life. You know, almost like, pff, you know, if you'd left Jesus, you could have it like me. I'm looking at him. It's amazing how those people can't actually see themselves in the mirror. Do you ever notice that? Like, I'm looking at him going, you think I want what you have right now? <laughs> you came into, into work, half your shirt is untucked. You forgot to shave this side of your beard, you know? You're like, I'm so happy. You're going, oh, yeah, you look like it, you know. Look like you just got out of a, you know, a, a beating. And you're telling me how great you have it? I'll, I'm going to stick with Jesus. Church, understand this. Our part is to abide. If you abide in the Lord, if there is a secret to Christianity, it's that. The ones who abide in Christ grow. The ones who fall for the the programs and plans, what happens, the Lord still loves you, but you get so disappointed and so discouraged, you think, and then Satan goes, God didn't come through for you, did he? Meanwhile, Jesus has been sitting there waiting for you. <laughs> Just come right to me. I made a way for you to spend time with me. It's so important. Let's move on, verse seven. He says, little children, and John says this over and over again, let no one deceive you. He says, he who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous john keeps it pretty simple for us doesn't he he says he who practices righteous is righteous just as he is righteous if you go john what exactly are you talking about uh, you're overthinking it number four if you're taking note number four in terms of sin and the child of god if you want to get free from sin abide in christ but number four is you need to cry out for deliverance you got to look to Jesus and say, you're the, ones, you're the one that can do this. I can't. And Lord, would you, would you rescue me? Would you help me? Oh, church, it's so important. John says this phrase over and over, let no one deceive you. There's two types of deception John talks about in this book. The first one, he says that you can actually deceive yourself. First John chapter 1, verse 8, remember that verse? He says, if anyone says they are without sin... They're a liar, 
and the truth isn't in them. If you think I've come to a place in my walk with the Lord, I don't sin like the rest of these Christian people here at this Calvary Chapel place. John says, John says with all the love in his heart, you're a liar and the truth isn't in you. That's why I love John. I'm gonna hang out with him in heaven. You know, you can deceive yourself. But then John warns of being deceived by others. And the word really means to cause other people to wander. I see this happen in the church. There's almost, there's almost an idea that if you are just a freelancer for Christianity, that you are like a higher Christian. The Bible says those folks are not effective for the gospel. Read your Bible. Who is a freelancer in the Bible? other than the Holy Ghost. God's people are always in fellowship. They're always a part of the body of Christ. And mark my words, be careful because deceivers will try to get you to wander. To wander. To, to get you to start going wherever the wind blows, right? No, <laughs> the Bible says stay the course, right? You stay the course. You know, I've a... Uh, I've been in New York since 2002 now. And for some of you, you've known me for a long time. For some of you, it's your first Sunday here. But I'm gonna tell you something. A lot has gone on since I got here. When I drove up in my Honda Prelude, you know, with every single thing in the car, I remember at Jacksonville, there was like an accident and I had to slam on the brakes and all of a sudden it was just, you know, like this. I was like, oh, this is a great beginning, you know. With an idea in my heart, Lord, you're definitely calling me. I couldn't, I couldn't withstand it anymore. And just come and say, Lord, I want to bring the gospel. What I did when I got here was I went to the basketball court to play basketball and started preaching the gospel. That's what I did. You know, I started sharing the gospel. I asked the Lord, what do you want me to do? I remember being on the streets. I remember being on the street of Middletown, sharing the gospel with a drug dealer and the police pulling me over when he was in my car. And him getting out and getting in a scuffle with the police, you know. I can recall spending hours and hours with people individually, just sitting down, sharing the word. So I remember showing people where the book of First Timothy is, you know. Just being and sharing and being a part. But can I say something to you? You have to stay the course, church. It, it, the, 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 the disguise of Christianity today the deception of Christianity that, that we should all kind of be wandering around, it's, it's a deception. It takes time to break through the, the work of the enemy. It takes time. You know, Jesus, before he sent out the disciples, he, he wanted to do more work, but he had to get the disciples ready to do it. It takes time. You know, the children of Israel was an 11-day journey. It took them how long? 40 years. Guys, as long as it takes for God with his people to prepare them so he can do what he wants to do with them, he'll do that. You see, the variable is not God. The variable is what? It's us. To where we realize we're a tool in his hand. You know, if every time we go to pick, he goes to pick up his tool, he's like, you ever, you ever done that, guys? You know, I know some of the women too. I know you have tools too. I'm sorry. You go to get one of your tools, there's, there's not much in the world that can get me more upset at my children than when I go to get a tool that I know where it is and I go, where's my tool, you know? Now God doesn't do that, but I think sometimes it disappoints him. He sets us up and he's ready to minister to this person and he's been preparing. He's like, I've got a servant right here ready to serve him. Where'd they go? They're gone. I prepared this unbeliever's heart. I was about to use this person to really change this person's life. And the tool's gone. It's a deceiver. They wander. It's not how God does things. You know, I've shared this with you so many times. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus was responsible for the redemption of humankind. And you know, Jesus was never in a rush. Never in a rush. The only time the God of the Bible was depicted of being in a rush was when the prodigal son was coming home. And he picked up his little Jewish skirt and ran, ran towards him. He couldn't wait. Other than that, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Church, we have to let God, if we genuinely want to see God do a work in this land, you got to let him work. 
And a lot of that work has to do with you. It has to do him working on you. Let's move on. Verse 8. We're almost through. He says, he who sins, John just keeps pounding it harder. He who sins is of the devil. (laughs) For the devil, he says, has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. Look at this. This is such a powerful verse. That he might destroy the works of the devil. That's what Satan's afraid of. Number five, if you're taking note, we're almost through. Sin in the child of God is Satan uses sin to destroy. Satan uses sin to destroy. You have to understand, the devil is the source of all sin. That's where it came from. The Bible teaches Lucifer was actually a a unique angel in the courts of heaven responsible for worship. His body, the Bible tells us in the Old Testament, Lucifer's body is actually an instrument. Lucifer did not have to play a guitar or a keyboard. (laughs) His body was the instrument, and he was gifted. But the Bible says, that's the seven I wills. I will ascend to be like the most high God. Lucifer wanted a place for himself. There's only one God, guys. None of us are God, right? He wanted that. In his rebellion, he brought sin into the world. What is sin? All sin is, if you're taking a note, jot it down. Sin is rebellion against God. That's all it is. It's rebellion against God. That's it, period. You know, that's why it's important we don't get legalistic. Well, that guy just sinned. He did that. Well, maybe his heart is right towards the Lord, and he's not sinning. Maybe he's not rebelling against God. You know, the key for you, and this is where Christians get off, is when they start worrying about what everybody else is doing, rather than, is my heart right before the Lord? Lord, am I rebelling against you? Is my heart soft before you? So important you do that, church. See, sin originated with the enemy, and you and I will take after our father. We will. Whoever your father is, you will take after. John 8, verse 44. This is also John the Apostle early on. uh, Quoting Jesus, he says, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he he is a liar and the father of it. Guys, listen. Satan brought sin into the world. Satan brought sin into the world. But John here tells us in verse 8, and I believe this is the most powerful verse in the book of 1 John, that Jesus was manifested, this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. The works is is the Greek word ergon. Ergon. It's energy. The Bible tells us, for it is God who works in us to will and to do for his good pleasure. That the good works that come from our life are the energy of the Lord working through us. But the Bible says, Jesus was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. Church, listen. Satan wants people to attack each other. He wants it. He wants different races to attack each other. Can I tell you? There's not much in this world that gets me more upset than that, you know, other than my, somebody taking my tools, you know, other than that, no. No, really, this is something that has always upset me. It is foolishness. It's foolishness. Read your Bibles. You had Adam, but then we had the fall of man. You have Noah. There's three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Guys, listen, we're all from the same boat, literally from the same boat, the ark, okay? <laughs> this is the, 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 the dispensation of the nations. This is where we came from. Why do I say this? The problems you say in this world, you see in this world, it's the work of the devil. That's what it is. But Jesus, when Jesus is manifested, when you or I just simply grow in our walk with the Lord and Jesus starts to come through in our life, we don't have to go around sin sniffing. You're still doing that, huh? You know? Go to our family. They don't know Jesus yet. We're like, you shouldn't be watching that on television. Why not? They're not saved. You watch worse than that when you weren't saved. It's not the reason. It's the work of the devil that you need to be concerned of. You manifest Jesus. You let people see Jesus in your life. You know what will happen? It will destroy the work of the devil. Those people that once were like, this Christian thing, 
It's for the birds. They're going to watch Jesus work in your life and they're going to start going, tell me more about this Jesus. You know, I might want a little bit of that in my life. It's what happens. The manifestation of Jesus destroys the work of Satan. Destroys it. So important, church. Got to catch this. Don't miss this. You want to have victory? You want to be used by Jesus in the kingdom? Like Jesus, abide in Christ. Let the life of Jesus flow in your life and watch what God does. It will blow your mind. He will destroy the work of the enemy and you won't even have to lift a finger. (laughs) You just stay the course. You just love the Lord. And God is so good at this. God is so good at this, but you have to understand Satan, much of his attack will be to get you to rebel against God or to sin. And the reason why is because he knows it will leave you miserable. It will put out your light and it will make you ineffective for the gospel. That's what he wants. He wants Christians to walk around with this Eeyore, you know, ho-hum mentality. Everything goes wrong with me. Meanwhile, the Lord's going, I came to give you life and life abundantly. Stay close. And we'll finish verse 9. He says this, whoever has been born of God does not sin. Once again, does not practice sin. You know, if you just read this, you're going, I don't think I'm a Christian. You know, I I say, who wants to receive Jesus? All you guys come up this Sunday. You know, it's like, I'm going to tell me a Christian, I sinned. It's practice sin. Practice sin. For his seed remains in him. That's the spirit of God and the word of God remains in you. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Number six, if you're taking note in terms of sin and the child of God, listen, arise and go to the Father. Arise and go to the Father. If you want to have victory in your walk with the Lord, you need to arise and go to the Father. Where did that come from? That comes from the story, the parable of the prodigal son. You see, you might read that and go, yeah, but the boy, he left and he went to the pig pen. Yeah, but the boy wasn't a pig. He was a child. And because of that, you know what happened? He couldn't stay in the pig pen. That's how you know the difference right there. If someone can, sometimes believers go into the pig pen. I've seen many times. But if they're a child of God, you know what? They're in the pig pen looking around at the pigs going, I'm not one of you. (laughs) What am I doing eating slop? What am I doing? And they arise, and that's what the son said. The prodigal said, let me arise and go to my father. Arise and go to your father. If you're born of God, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. That word born of God, it means to procreate or to regenerate. This is what we call the new birth. The apostles talked about this frequently. And I have a picture here I think really well illustrates this. The new birth. You see, you start off as a caterpillar, right? And some of us are some really ugly caterpillars. Really ugly caterpillars. We start off like this. That's what I look like right there, you know? Some of us are just ugly caterpillars, man, just crawling on the ground, just kind of getting through the dirt, just going through it. But then what happens? You hear about Jesus, the new birth, metamorphosis, you're changed. You're changed from a caterpillar to a butterfly. There's a legitimate change that happens in your life. People say, these people say, born again. What does it mean? That's basically what it means right there. It means you changed. There's a transformation in your life. But you know what happens, and I believe this is what John is talking about here, that when a, cat, when a butterfly who's been changed goes back to live like a caterpillar, goes on the ground, it's not a good thing. It's a dangerous thing. I think it is, if we're going to change the slide here. I'm not sure. That's what happens. All of a sudden we're there, and the frog's looking at us going... Yummy, yummy, right? That's what happens. I won't show you the next slide. I'll just give you a hint. The butterfly's not there anymore. Okay. I'm just kidding. Kind of. (laughs) That's the transformation, guys. Listen, I believe, I believe in the security of the believer. I believe if you're here and you've said yes to Jesus, I believe you should be secure in your salvation. But I also believe in the insecurity of the make-believer. I believe in that. 
I'm not the guy that you're going to say, I don't really know if I'm saved, pastor. And I'm going to say, oh, you are. <laughs> you know, when you were eight, you got baptized. I mean, that's not going to be me. I, I always like to say this. How did you know who was a follower of Jesus when Jesus was on the earth? The way you knew was because when you met him, they're like, yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus. You go, where is he? I want to meet him. Well, I actually was a follower of Jesus, but that was like seven years ago. Now I'm not really sure where he is. Oh, maybe you want to go back to him. Maybe you want to come back. The Lord loves you so, so much. Guys, in light of all these things, in light of what John tells us, I want to challenge you. Examine your life. Examine your life. You know, it, it, have you gotten very comfortable in sin? Uh, are you finding yourself starting to like get more and more comfortable in sin? It's the story of the frog in the pot. You take a frog, you put it in a boiling pot, it jumps out. But when you put a frog in a pot, then you put it on the stove, and little by little you heat it up. It doesn't even know it's being cooked. You know, as Christians, we shouldn't be living, man, how close can I get to sin? But, you know, I'm not going to do it. We should be saying, where's Jesus? I want to abide in him. I want to be with him. Examine your life in light of these things, church. Examine your walk with the Lord. Examine your fellowship with other believers. John, in the next section, is going to talk to us about our fellowship with Jesus. Maybe you're struggling in sin. Maybe you've been struggling with this sin a long time in your walk. Listen, two things. I want to challenge you. Really focus on abiding in Christ, meaning staying in the word, making sure you're in prayer, making sure you're in fellowship. And number two, cry out to Jesus. Cry out to Jesus. We don't have too much more time, but I want to tell you something. You know, I think sometimes we miss this. I know I was a man that needed to cry out to Jesus. You know, you know, I came from a family tree. One side was pretty good. The other side was pretty bad. You know, pretty bad family tree. You know, pretty much anything you could think of <laughs> was happening. I'm not going to go into details for the sake of my family and the fact that my children may listen to this one day. And, uh, but, but these things were, you know, there's no, I don't believe in generational curses, but I believe in you got a dad and you watch him and you start to act like that. You know, I believe in that. And I could see these things manifesting in my own life. And then Jesus, as only Jesus could do, went, poof, broke through. And I was saved. Just because I was saved didn't know, didn't mean I didn't know about where caterpillars go and what they do. And I, I, I had to cry out to the Lord. I had to say, Lord, would you change this man? You know, would you change me? Would you change me? I still remember the day. I remember I'm more focused on myself. I'm more focused on growing myself. I remember being at the church where I was growing up in. You know, I'm saved now. I'm working at the church. And I still remember another young man. We're like scrubbing floors together. And he looks at me and he goes, I'm going to be the youth pastor here, not you. The, until this day, that thought process still baffles me. Because I remember when he said that to me, I thought to myself, there must be a guy behind me right now. Like somebody else. Because I thought, dude, I'm just trying to like keep my mind thinking about Jesus and not something I shouldn't be thinking about right now. I'm trying to grow in my walk with the Lord. You know, I'm trying to make sure that I scrub this floor properly. You know, not, I can't wait till I'm the youth pastor. Yes. I'm telling you, church, I don't understand that thought process. What I know is this. If you stick with Jesus, he does it. He's able to do it. Listen, you abide in Christ. You cry out to Jesus. And I'll close with this story. I know I said I'll close like seven times today, but uh, this one's true. Uh, John Patton, he was a missionary in the New Hybrids Islands. And one night, hostile natives surrounded the mission statement, intend on burning out the Pattons and killing them. Patton and his wife prayed during that terror-filled night that God would deliver them. When daylight came, they were amazed to see their attackers leave. A year later, a year later the chief of the tribe was converted to Christ, remembering what had happened. Patton asked the chief what had kept him from burning down the house and killing them. The chief replied in surprise. He said, who were all those men with you there? Patton knew no man. He knew no men were present. 
But the chief said he was afraid to attack because he had seen hundreds of big men in shining garments with John swords circling the mission station. Listen. The works of Satan is what the church of Jesus Christ needs to be concerned about. Not other people. Not, not other attacks. It's the work of the enemy. The way that the enemy is defeated is by abiding in Christ. It's by manifesting Jesus. Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell do not stand a chance against Jesus. Not even a chance. All we have to do is let Jesus just keep, keep being formed in us. And as he is, you will be shocked of what God is able to do. Amen? We're going to close in a song and we're going to partake of communion. If you don't have one of these little cups, please